Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us today. My name is Diana Fu. I'm a non-resident senior fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center here at Brookings, as well as an associate professor of Chinese politics at the University of Toronto. On behalf of my colleagues at, in the Brookings China Center, I'm just thrilled to welcome all of you to today's very timely and important event. I am told we have an almost Unprecedented number, unprecedented number of participants joining, which just speaks to the prominence of our panelists as well as to the timeliness of this discussion. Over the past 40 years since the country opened to the world, China has been increasingly powerful both domestically as well as internationally. China has debunked the modernization theory. Contrary to predictions, China's economic liberalization has not ushered in political liberalization. And recent geopolitical, ideological, and economic clashes between the U.S. and China have led to talk of a world of the Cold World 2.0. So today's event features four distinguished authors of new books focusing on the historical, political, and economic elements that shape the current state of U.S.-China relationship. And all four books are available via Brookings Bookstore online. We will be discussing a number of topics, including what are the factors that have led to China's drastic transformation, what are the current domestic and external challenges, what is the state and future of U.S.-China relations, and of course, we will try to get to balloons and other aerial objects that may be on everybody's minds. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists in alphabetical order. First, we have Chris Marcus who is the Sinai, uh, Sydney Professor of Chinese Management at the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge. His book, Mao and Markets, The Communist Roots of Chinese Enterprise, assesses how China's economic success continues to be shaped by the communist ideology of Chairman Mao. We are also joined by Steve Roach, who is a senior fellow at the Jackman, Jackson Institute for Global Affairs at Yale University. He is author of the book, America, China, and the Clash of False Narratives. He argues that the false narratives from both China and America, amplified by information distortion, are more of a reflection of each nation's exaggerated fears of the other than an honest self-assessment of problems of their own making. We also have with us Susan Shirk, who is a professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. Her book, Overreach, How China Derailed Its Peaceful Rise, explains the domestic roots of China's transformation from fragile superpower, the title of her first book, to global heavyweight, as well as the dynamics driving its overreach. And we also have Sui Shen Zhao, who is the director of the Yosef Korbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver. He is author of the book, The Dragon Roars Back, Transformational Leaders and Dynamics of China, Chinese Foreign Policy, which examines the primary forces that have driven China's reemergence to global power. So we'll begin with a very brief opening remarks by each of the panelists and then move into the open discussion. We've already received a number of audience questions. Um, if you have questions in the meantime, please email it to events at brookings.edu. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter at hashtag Rethinking China. So without further ado, it is now time to turn to our panelists. So I have a question for all four of you. All four of you uh, suggest a different way of thinking about China's trajectory as a rising power. So can you please give us a brief uh, five, minute, five minute, no more than five minute take on how your very rich uh, books debunks the popular assumption about China's trajectory economically and politically? What did previous scholars and China watchers get wrong? And how does your book correct some of those assumptions about China's future path? So let's start again in alphabetical order with Chris. Oh, Chris, I think you're muted. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, you think after three years, I would unmute myself. Um, uh, so first, you know, thanks so much for the great intro, Diana. I want to thank Brookings and also 
Chun Li and Ryman McElveen for this great opportunity to be with such amazing other sets of scholars and, and, and books. I know it's not usual that as an M last name, I'm first alphabetically. So it's also, you know, great to, to be here with people with uh, names from the last name of the alphabet as well. Um, so I guess, you know, starting, I, I would say about our book, the area that we try to examine and in some ways debunk, which you mentioned actually in your opening uh, as well, Diana, is, you know, the wishful thinking, I think very much that China, as it economically modernized, would actually end up becoming more politically liberal. You know, this is something that is well established in economic development modernization theory as a common relationship. And I think, you know, since Deng's reforms in the late 1970s, early 1980s and, and, and beyond, you know, this was what U.S. policymakers, global policymakers, you know, sort of assumed in actually how China was approached by businesses, by, uh, by political entities. You know, China is admitted in 2001 to the WTO and, you know, President Clinton at the time said something to the effect that this was, you know, the, you know like a one-way economic street, uh, you know, where the assumption was that, that China would be, um, you know, sort of becoming much more liberal politically. And this also led to decades of, you know, engagement policy on the parts of, you know, politicians in the U.S. and globally from all political persuasions. Uh, so what we try to examine in the book, though, that actually uh, that that this period actually of Deng and Jiang and Hu and 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 everyone else that sort of you know was underneath them uh, was really what the aberration was. It's not you know many people are saying you know she, you know surprised at how sort of hardline uh, Xi Jinping is, and so we you know try to examine by looking at politicians, looking at business leaders and entrepreneurs how actually there is a thread from Mao to, uh, to Xi and through the society, political leaders and business leaders that, um, that might have been ignored. I think that, you know, we had this wishful thinking that, you know, we, you know, saw giant markets in China and, you know, th wanted to take advantage and capitalize on those. And, you know, a well-known psychological bias that we discuss in the book is confirmation bias, where we look for evidence to confirm our underlying beliefs. And, you know, we all thought that China was going to liberalize. We were thinking that China would become more like us instead of actually, you know, have its own unique political economy with the CCP very strongly uh, at the center. Uh, so we try to break out of this, you know, confirmation bias trap, so to speak, by really rooting our analyses in uh, a number of studies which were published, you know, over the past 10 years in peer-reviewed academic journals that start with the actual data and relationships between, you know, political actors, business actors, and actually what's happening on the ground um, in, in China. You know, this, I, we think that this was an important way to start because, you know, I think it was James Fallows that, that wrote about, you know, because China is so vast and complex, you can find almost anything you want sort of happening somewhere. And so it's very easy to, to sort of have confirmation bias. Uh, and so we look in detail in the book at the depth of how the CCP influences life in China and the commitment to the CCP uh, for many people, uh, particularly those, as I mentioned, our analyses looks at business leaders, entrepreneurs, and also political leaders. Uh, again, sort of, you know, we try to actually write the book in a readable style with stories and anecdotes and, you know, from our own qualitative research and interviews, but, but also, you know, from media reports, but, but underlying those stories are these, you know, peer reviewed uh, journal articles. And so, you know, this is important, I think, for business leaders as they engage in China, but also political leaders as well, because as, you know, um, as, as I mean, we've seen, you know, uh, President Xi has returned to many of the sort of more ideologically driven, but per, you know, perhaps hardline policies and practices that are reflective also of Mao and, and the earlier CCP. And I think as we continue to think about how to engage, and I think that engaging with China is hugely important, but we have to do it from a realistic standpoint and understand that just because Liu He says at Davos that China is open for business, 
that actually, you know, we should maybe take that with a grain of salt and think about actually the deeper underlying political and economic systems. Wonderful. I have some follow-up questions about the title of your book, right? The specter sure. now right. hovering over everything. But sure. uh, before I do that, I uh, wanted to turn it over to Steve with the same questions about what your book debunks and what did other people get wrong. Thank you. And uh, I would just <clears throat> add uh, uh, um, a, a note of gratitude to Brookings. Um, back in the Jurassic era, my first uh, position out of grad school was a Brookings research fellow where I completed my dissertation. So I've always been a special fondness for Brookings in the uh, deep recesses of my heart and career. Uh, I think Chris has the um, uh, the time uh, frame correct uh, in noting the, the sharp difference between uh, Mao and um, uh, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao. But I would argue that um, sort of the return to Mao under uh, Xi Jinping is truly the aberration uh, and not necessarily uh, something that connects uh, these two important bookends of modern China's history. The Deng Xiaoping model, which um, was followed, I think, um, reasonably well by um, Jiang Zemin and uh, Hu Jintao, was a flexible model. And it was so flexible that um, right around 2007 uh, began a, um, an intense internal debate as to how the model should be modified uh, to move away from uh, an economic framework that stressed um, uh, growth being driven by exports and investment to one increasingly driven by China's rising middle-class consumer. Uh, and it was an encouraging and refreshing rethinking of uh, the framework that had worked so well uh, for nearly 30 years uh, and Xi Jinping has is basically backtracked on all aspects, or I shouldn't say all, but most aspects of that transition, shifting power back to state-owned enterprises and their low productivity bias, which is really problematic given the rapid aging of the uh, uh, the working age population um, uh, or the population in general in China and the decline of the working age population that's now uh, been evident for uh, eight years. Uh, and um, I think that, that the um, uh, the problem with Xi Jinping's approach uh, very much reflects the, the points that Chris made. It's more driven uh, by ideology, uh, by a, um, uh, a power consolidation under the guise of anti-corruption, uh, and a a standing committee right now, uh, courtesy of the 20th Party Congress, that is packed with loyalists who are um, unwilling or afraid to speak truth to power. Uh, and so that ensnares China deeper and deeper uh, in conflict uh, with others, most notably the United States. And the final point I would make um, is that um, unwilling to face up to its own vulnerabilities of a failed uh, uh, rebalancing and uh, a failed opening up uh, of its um, uh, of its system, uh, China has uh, turned to scapegoating the U.S. Uh, for its containment policies, which are certainly uh, very fact based and and you can support as the excuse as to why it has not completed the rebalancing and opening up. And this is an example of what I write about in my new book, um, uh, China's False Narratives with Respect to the U.S. It's one of many, and I you know, have to be fair here, the U.S. is equally culpable, culpable in blaming uh, China for its big trade deficit when that stems from problems of our own making, notably the lack of saving. And so this confluence of many false narratives on both sides of the relationship has led to deepening un uh, misunderstandings between uh, these uh, two uh, uh, strong uh, 
uh, strongest nations uh, in in the world. Uh, and this clash of false narratives, I argue, is the high octane fuel of conflict uh, escalation, which in the last five years has resulted in a trade war, a tech war, and now the early stages of a new Cold War. It doesn't take much of a spark to turn a Cold War hot. Uh, it could be uh, any one of a number of things, Taiwan, South China Sea, or who knows, maybe even the popping of a balloon. But I'll stop on that point. Great. Um, we'll circle back also to the point you raised about the, demogra the demographic crisis. Um, let's now turn to Susan. Susan, you're muted. Well, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Chung Lee. Thank you, Brookings. It's, uh, it's really uh, fun to be talking about these four books all together, um, especially for me because Sui Shung got his PhD from MIT, I mean, from UCSD, and uh, I was his thesis advisor, and so I am naturally have a lot of pride of all the wonderful work he has accomplished. I mean, for so many years, he's been so much more productive than I have, and uh, so I really admire and uh, seek to emulate him as the teacher learns from the student. So um, my book, I think, will surprise readers because I argue that China's overreach didn't begin with Xi Jinping. And of course, the definition of overreach is to take things too far, to do them in an exaggerated manner, in a way that snaps back to harm yourself self-defeating, uh, overly aggressive foreign policy and overly repressive and statist domestic policy. And uh, when, of course, most of my career as an old China hand, we've seen China and the United States managing to get along after Mao died surprisingly well, despite China's rapid uh, strengthening of its economy and its military capabilities, and despite the vast differences in our political systems, but uh, due in large part to China's own policies designed to reassure the United States and other countries that even though it was rising so rapidly, its intentions were friendly, it was not a threat, um, and also to a kind of generosity and goodwill on the part of the US in welcoming China into the community of nations and the world order things were going moderately well until the mid 2000s. So that's the big surprise, is that this begins under collective leadership between the two terms of Hu Jintao. It actually begins even before the global financial crisis and is due largely to the um, some of the uh, perverse features of collective leadership, which had been designed by Deng Xiaoping after Mao in order to prevent what Deng called the over-concentration of authority, which led to arbitrary decisions, tragic decisions, like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. But um, uh, collective leadership under Hu Jintao was really oligarchic leadership. Instead of the interest groups, bureaucratic interest groups, constraining one another, checking one another, instead they log rolled on one another. And every oligarch, in particular, the head of the control, what I call the control coalition, uh, Zhou Yongkang, in this standing committee with nine members now, 
uh, was able to hijack policy. Nobody stopped him. Nobody stopped, Hu Jintao didn't stop him. And the other interest groups also didn't stop him. And so everybody was, there's tremendous lack of coordination leading to uh, assertive challenges to Southeast Asian countries in the South China Sea, which drastically changed the narrative about what kind of rising power China was, the return to state statist management of the economy uh, to build indigenous innovation and domestically, and also social control, grid management, which uh, develops especially right before the 2008 Beijing Olympics. So it's a story in which uh, nothing about this was inevitable. It was a, uh, so what I'm debunking is the international relations scholars who believe that China's rise the reactions of the United States, the uh, Graham Allison view and the Thucydides trap view is incorrect. And that, uh, that um, there's a lot of human agency here and it reflects the nature of Chinese politics in this period of collective leadership. But then the problems of collective leadership, especially the massive corruption, enables Xi Jinping to get a mandate to establish a stronger, more centralized uh, version of Chinese Communist Party rule. And uh, so his anti-corruption campaign, which is very popular with the public, is also a purge of, of his rivals, real and imagined. And this purge, which continues to present day and has become something of a permanent purge, such as described by Zbigniew Brzezinski about the Soviet Union, has really so uh, intimidated and, cre and created a climate of fear in Chinese officialdom, that what it means is that in order to survive and preserve their own careers, you get a very different overreach dynamic here, which officials jump on the bandwagon behind Xi Jinping's uh, policies, many of which are arbitrary and mistakes, policy mistakes that are harmful to China. They also over comply, they overdo their implementation of those policies. Look at zero COVID, three years of zero COVID. And they um, don't dare give him accurate information feedback. As a result, uh, China is in, uh, is really the economy's on the ropes. Uh, there's a big international backlash against China's wolf warrior diplomacy, aggressive policies toward Taiwan, Japan, Australia, India. You get all these coalitions uh, pushing back against China. And so the third term is likely to be uh, an even worse version of overreach under this concentrated authority of Xi Jinping. So we have Susan uh, bringing agency back into structure, which as a comparative scholar, I couldn't agree more with. And I think Susan, you mentioned earlier too, that there's another part of your argument that debunks an, another assumption, which is um, very much in the media that everything changed with Xi Jinping. Right. But I think your book evidence is so well that the overreach that you document, the exaggeration, um, actually didn't start with Xi Jinping. It started with his predecessor. Right. So more on that later. We'll turn from the master to the student who is now has become a master himself. So over to you, Suishin. Uh, thank you, Diana. And uh, Chen Li, 
and uh, Bruggins. I'm really thrilled uh, with such a distinguished group of scholars, especially my former advisor, Professor Susan Shirk, and uh, sh her modesty is not very typical American now, <laughs> but uh, she taught me that uh, modesty is a virtue in every culture. I still remember that, uh, but in Chinese culture, you, if you are my teacher one day, you'll be my teacher all my life. So I would learn always from you. And uh, so among the four books, uh, two books are on domestic trajectory of uh, China's rise, two are, two are on China's rise uh, on a global stage. So my book it tracks uh, the trajectory of uh, China's uh, rise uh, on the global stage and also tries to understand uh, what are the driving forces behind this rise. Uh, 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 structural realism and uh, regime type theory have been used uh, most often to explain China's rise, uh, which always almost become uh, conventional wisdoms. Uh, 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 Strata realism argues that uh, when China expands its uh, power, uh, its ambition uh, expands. Uh, so uh, China's uh, rise is uh, some, somehow like a, a linear process uh, going with its uh, rise of power. But this cannot explain many turns and twists of the PRC uh, foreign policy behavior in the last 70 years years. Uh, uh, when, um, uh, during Mao Zedong's years, uh, uh, China was, uh, China's relative power was uh, weak, but Mao launched six cross-border walls, including a wall with the most powerful nation uh, in the world, US, in Korea, and a fought war with the Soviet Union and with India, with many other countries. Uh, uh, but uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, came to office, uh, moderated uh, Chinese foreign policy. Uh, his successors, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, continued that process of uh, uh, moderation. Uh, but China's relative power during this period uh, has been rising. And, uh, and so that cannot explain that uh, uh, process, I mean, behavior too. Then Xi Jinping came to office. We all know that uh, he overreached, as the Professor Susan Shirk spoke, talk about, uh, overplayed his hand. Although China's economy has been slowing down, and uh, there are so many problems with Chinese uh, uh, um, power foundation. Uh, so the structural realism cannot explain well about China's uh, long term uh, uh, international behavior. Regime type. Theory will argue that has argued that uh, uh, all the problems, aggress aggressive behavior or whatever, uh, should be attributed to China's uh, authoritarian uh, system. In other words, if we don't have regime change, we will not see change in China's foreign policy behavior. That cannot be true either. So we already see so many changes, uh, sometimes uh, very dramatic changes in China's foreign policy behavior. But China's authoritarian regime has not been uh, changed. So my book uh, developed a leadership-centered uh, framework and argues that uh, leaders matter in all political systems, but matter more in Leninist uh, authoritarian system, especially in China, where uh, hierarchy and discipline uh, are emphasized. And uh, uh, in democracies, uh, leaders uh, are constrained by uh, public opinions, by uh, opportunity parties, uh, by term li limits. Uh, in China, authoritarian system, uh, uh, leaders are not constrained, relatively unconstrained uh, by public opinions, by uh, those uh, will not mention about oppositional forces or uh, where often they hold the lifetime uh, uh, tenure. But the question here, the puzzle for me here is that uh, not every Chinese leaders at the top have uh, used that power to charter, chart new costs for Chinese foreign policy. And uh, in that case, I try to distinguish Chinese leaders into three types. Uh, one is uh, transformational leaders, 
who are game changers. And these leaders have new visions uh, for the new direction of China, Chinese foreign policy in this case. And also they have a political wisdoms to prevail uh, in a jungle of uh, China's power, power, internal power uh, politics. And also to mobilize domestic sources such as ideational uh, sources and institutional sources and uh, strategically respond to international uh, distribution of power and also international norms, regimes, institutions, everything, and uh, to advance their uh, policy agenda. Uh, here, what I am talking about uh, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and Xi Jinping, each charters unique cause of Chinese foreign policy. Mao Zedong's foreign policy, I call that revolutionary foreign policy. Deng Xiaoping's foreign policy, I call the developmental uh, foreign policy. And uh, Xi Jinping policy, of course, in his own words, big power, uh, foreign policy. And uh, second type of leaders uh, are what I call the transactional leaders. Uh, and these leaders uh, manage to maintain their power, navigate in the power uh, uh, jungle in PRC. And, uh, but they stayed on course set by their predecessor here. I'm talking about Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. They stayed on course set by Deng Xiaoping, no profile, non-confrontational, everything. And uh, the third type of leaders uh, are failed leaders. Uh, they might have new visions, but who cares? And they lost power in the jungle of uh, politics. Uh, uh, Hua Guofeng, uh, uh, Zhao Ziyang, and uh, uh, Hu Yaobang. And they might want to chart new, new forces, uh, new causes, but they, they failed. And uh, so, my book tries to document uh, how this um, focused on the three uh, uh, transformational leaders and document how their visions, their political wisdoms, and uh, their domestic and international operations have uh, uh, met them uh, uh, to set new course for China. The focus is on Xi Jinping. Here, I really learned so much from my former advisor, Xi Jinping really has been overreached and how he has been overreached by his uh, misperceived um, uh, perceived uh, vision and also by his uh, uh, political behavior domestically and internationally. Wonderful. Um, so since we talked quite a bit already about um, you know, from more of a theoretical and conceptual standpoint, I want to turn to what many in our audience must be wondering, which is what to do. So um, I want to skip to um, a question that I was going to save for later, but I, I want to do it, do it right now. Um, a common theme that runs through all these books is that of correcting path, correcting the path that the U.S. and China are on now, which seems to be one of competition, conflict, misunderstanding, overreach. And I think this is most evident in Susan and Steve's books, which both reference a Cold War 2.0 between the U.S. and China. So Susan, uh, you've argued for um, C to curb his overreach and you advise in your book among many uh, uh, recommendations to open dialogue with Taiwan and to close the internment camps in Xinjiang among other suggestions in order to temper what you see as this overreach. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you arrived at those, um, uh, those advice and what would be the channels to communicate this message to Xi given uh, you know, decoupling and unwillingness on both sides to really listen to each other. So over to you, Susan, and then we'll turn to Steve. Oh, you're muted again, Susan. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. As you point out, my book is primarily a, um, uh, an analysis based on a lot of interviewing and documents on how Chinese domestic politics shapes its foreign policy as well as its domestic policies. Um, and it's not really a policy book, but the last chapter does give advice to both Beijing and Washington on how to stabilize relations and prevent the Cold War from turning into uh, even worse, uh, a hot war. My advice to China um, is I have no good suggestions about channels to 
make sure that this advice gets to Xi Jinping. Obviously, he we should translate my book and make sure that Xi Jinping reads the last chapter. Um, but actually, I wrote the book with a Chinese audience in mind because I did want people in China to uh, think about that not nothing that's happened so far is inevitable, that it's a matter of the political choices of political figures and that they could change their policies. And um, so I think from, and you look at the past precedent on the Chinese side, you look at how Hu Jintao protected the effort to integrate Taiwan and prevent Taiwan independence through a kind of more peaceful economic integration strategy is very interesting. And remember who was the person working for Hu Jintao who carried out that very effective integration and diplomacy, it was Wang Yi who now under Xi Jinping is sort of your number one wolf warrior diplomat. Um, so that uh, shows us how there are possibilities for the future should China moderate its policy. On the US side, I make the case that what we need to do is test whether or not the Xi Jinping concentrated uh, personalistic dictatorial system is capable of moderating policy once the costs of its overreach have become so evident, especially on the economic side and the coalitions to balance against China internationally. And of course, now even protests over the extremes of zero COVID. So, uh, and that's why I really was hopeful about the Blinken visit uh, as the start of a process of trying to uh, engage in give and take a process of diplomacy that includes sanctions, includes sticks, as well as carrots, but in a, integrated in a process of diplomacy not overreacting by just whacking them with sanctions without a strategy of how to use those sanctions to try to induce moderation and change in Chinese behavior. So Steve, I think you also have um, a very people-centered argument. And I like what you said to me earlier about, um, you know, relationship problems require relations getting worked on. So could you tell us a bit more about what you argue in your book in moving from codependency to interdependence? And you mentioned suggestions including a bilateral investment treaty and the establishment of U.S.-China secretariat. Um, you know, you, you, you basically propose all of these relational mechanisms that need to be set up, but also structures and institutions to facilitate those kinds of um, relational dialogues. Could you tell us a bit about why those are your proposals? And given the complexities of politics on the DC side, how you think uh, any of this would be feasible? Well, thank you, Diana. Um, just, just to pick up on that, um, <clears throat> The relationship aspect of this is absolutely critical to uh, this book and its proposed um, framework of conflict resolution. Uh, contrary to what um, you know, you pick up in every American newspaper every day, uh, the U.S. does not have a China problem. Uh, China does not have an American problem. Together, we have a problem in managing the relationship between us. So how do you how do you implement these uh, proposals that you just enumerated, uh, the, the, the bilateral investment treaty or a new uh, secretariat-like organization? Uh, the obvious um, thing that's missing from that equation is to move from distrust to trust. There is no trust at all 
between the United States and China right now? None. Uh, can you name um, one sitting member of the U.S. House of Representatives or the United States Senate who is in favor of re-engagement in any form with China right now? Uh, the House enacted by a vote of 365 to 65 uh, a couple of weeks ago, the establishment of a, of a new select committee, I like to call it the Select Committee on China Bashing, because I'm certain that's what its a a purpose uh, will initially be. So on trust, <clears throat> I think um, there are some low-hanging fruit and there's some tough issues that can be done. The low-hanging fruit that could be picked is reopening closed consulates uh, in both nations, in um, relaxing visa requirements, uh, in restarting foreign exchange uh, uh, student programs between the two nations that have been so important uh, over a, a long period of time. Tougher to do, but equally uh, essential, is in relaxing serious constraints that have now been placed on the operation of uh, NGOs. And then the big issues uh, that are critically important in, in uh, trust building, uh, climate change, um, health, especially uh, uh, in a pandemic, and of course, cybersecurity. If we begin to make progress on, on trust, and I just stress the word begin, uh, then we can um, uh, do the, the, the other two uh, issues that I uh, talk about explicitly in my book that are more framework issues, uh, a bilateral investment treaty where the negotiations were 95% of the way done uh, prior to the election of Donald Trump, these lower investment barriers and our pro-growth much more effective than uh, trying to uh, implement um, uh, uh, zero-sum uh, uh, agreements focused on bilateral deficit reduction that do nothing uh, for either country. And then finally, uh, the uh, the institutional proposal that I'm actually most excited about uh, is the establishment of a full-time U.S.-China secretariat, uh, which, um, you know, uh, really alters the architecture of engagement uh, between the two nations. It used to be focused on, you know, once or twice a year, um, uh, annual strategic and economic dialogues, uh, which basically accomplished very little over a long period of time. Uh, and now, you know, we have meetings um, either by Zoom or, um, you know, the, the, the Bali three and a half hour uh, summit between uh, leaders. And we were hoping but didn't get, uh, you know, the Blinken follow-up mission uh, this past weekend. That's not the way to engage uh, our major <coughs> uh, um, adversary uh, in uh, the world of um, geostrategic power. Uh, a secretariat located in a neutral venue, call it Switzerland, would work full-time, 24-7, on all aspects of the engagement from economics and trade to uh, innovation policy and, and technology transfer to subsidies of uh, state-sponsored activities, uh, to, yes, climate, uh, health, cyber, and even human rights. Uh, it would uh, have a convening uh, uh, power to bring in experts from around the world to deal with thorny problems like COVID, uh, and it would have a compliance and dispute resolution mechanism uh, to manage existing and new agreements. The plan is not perfect, but I'd certainly welcome, uh, you know, any better ideas uh, from any of my three colleagues on this on this uh, call today. Great, and I see a common thread between yourself and uh, Susan in that posing or framing the bilateral relationship as really a collective action problem to be solved on both sides. And I couldn't agree with you more that when. Uh, channels are blocked uh, when there's mistrust on the official channels, especially the higher up you go, the harder it is to dialogue. Uh, there can be and should be people to people exchange, um, such as the different types that you mentioned between businesses, between NGOs, between students. But those 
um, those exchanges need institutions to fil facilitate them. So I want to now turn back to um, Chris and Sui Sheng. Uh, you can feel free to react to any of uh, the recommendations that our other two speakers um, have given. But I also did want to um, come back to, uh, you know, Mao and um, and and markets. So I had a question for Christopher, um, for Chris, you provocati provocatively link Mao to markets and you essentially argue, I mean, this is my words, but um, you argue that Mao's specter has been essentially hovering over China's market logic for decades and that um, it, importantly, that China's economic success was precisely due to this continued influence of Maoist ideologies rather than being constrained by it. But what do you make of Xi Jinping's crackdown on the private entrepreneurs, uh, on the tech entrepreneurs uh, sectors, especially in late 2020, and its subsequent easing um, very recently this year to stimulate growth after the pandemic? Doesn't this kind of Maoist style um, campaign, which is highly unpredictable, scare off investors um, you know, who think that, well, if China can do an about face on COVID policies, and it has done about face on crackdowns on the tech sector, um, aren't China's markets just riskier and riskier and more volatile because no one ever knows what campaign the party is going to launch next? So, uh, yeah, sort of on, on your discussion of sort of assessment of Xi's actions in the economy, uh, I couldn't be sort of more aligned in an agreement. I think that, you know, they're, you know, I'm sure very scary to investors and, and actually I think very long-term and short-term detrimental to the Chinese, um, Chinese economy. Uh, you know, your, um, you, you mentioned your, your words. I, I would actually, and as a reader, I respect, um, you know, sort of your assessment of, of our argument, but I, I would, you know, maybe phrase a little differently what our, our goal is for the book, because, you know, Mao is sort of famously, um, you know, or famously led to many tremendously, um, sort of tremendous economic and human disasters. I mean, the Great Leap Forward being, you know, sort of maybe the most prominent where, you know, his ideas of sort of catching up to the UK and US and steel production, you know, led to a great famine where, you know, upwards of 40 million people died. Uh, so our interest is not necessarily in really connecting Mao's economic policies, but really understanding how socialization happens uh, into the CCP and just more broadly, and that actually the sort of propaganda uh, ways in which people enter the party actually have a longstanding effect on their cognition. Uh, and this is something where there's lots of social science research on on this topic. And so, you know, it's er a lot of areas where we actually examine the things that either entrepreneurs or politicians actually do are actually against their economic interests, against and in, in, you know you know the growth of actually the you know the the sort of city that the politicians in, or actually the you know business that's run. So I think you know we um, we think you know we in in the West talk to people talk to leaders in China and they say you know sort of wink wink nudge you know we don't actually all this sort of Maoist um, you know you know rhetoric we may not believe, but actually you know because of the socialization process, what we find is that actually those feelings sort of run very deep. And so I do think uh, that the, you know, the, the sort of neo-Maoist moves that you mentioned um, and sort of the backtracking and 180s on the tech industry and on COVID and all this stuff, I think, you know, are, you know, both sides, you know, hugely, hugely de detrimental. And I think also another, in some ways, you know, neo-Maoist strategy, set of strategies that she has is, around the sort of campaign logic or campaign, campaign style of doing things. I mean, there's, you know, the anti-corruption campaign, there's a people's war against COVID, you know, in the economic realm, there's this sort of, you know, very much, I think, campaign focus around semiconductors where, you know, uh, she talks about, you know, concentrating strength to do big things. And I think this is actually a strategy in a setting like semiconductors that just is doomed to failure because, you know, huge amounts of subsidies, um, you know, overwhelming support of just domestic industries ignores the fact that in, a, in, a, in an industry as complex as that, 
you know, international human capital networks, suppliers is absolutely essential. And so you've seen, you know, SMIC, you know, um, has been one of the leading patent patenters in China for a long time. Well, you know, when you have these very top down systems uh, of, of trying to encourage innovation, you know, patents is a way to measure that. And so there's a lot of sort of production of patents, but whether they're high quality or not, you know, is, is another uh, sort of is another factor. So I do think that that the, in some ways return by Xi to many of these, um, you know, sort of hardline, um, you know, economic policies and plans, I think, I think really hurts, um, hurts China economically. And, and that, that worries me because uh, not just, you know, China doing well, but also, you know, authoritarian regimes, if they don't have, or, or aren't delivering economically for their citizens, uh, there may be questions from the citizens as to, you know, what good the regime is. I think people, if they, they're economically growing and their kids are going to be better, I mean, they, they can actually, you know, support the regime. And so if, that, if they start to get, you know, more um, significant pushback, like with the COVID protests after the longstanding lockdowns, you know, this could create further uncertainty, maybe result in, you know, doing other things to sort of reassert the legitimacy of the party, like, you know, even trying to take Taiwan. So I think I think it's a very sort of scary couple of years we have as these poor economic policies probably are going to lead to economic disruptions. So not a great outlook for investors. Um, yeah, I wouldn't put my money in China. <laughs> um, so uh, Sui Sheng, I wanted to come back to uh, your leadership trajectories. And you mentioned that um, you sort of put Mao and Deng and uh, Xi on the same pedestal as chief architects or, or transformational leaders. And so what do you think, and you mentioned um, that, uh, you know, while Mao was a revolutionary transformation leader, Deng was a developmentalist a transformation leader, Xi is a great powers transformational leader. Can you talk a little bit more about what distinguishes Xi from his two predecessors? And what should inv Western investors and policymakers be aware of when, a risk, when assessing political risk under Xi Jinping's uh, transformation of China's path? All the three leaders are the most powerful leaders in the PRC history and all, as you said, architects of a new cause for, the China, uh, for China domestically and internationally. And uh, but the question here people ask is uh, who is more powerful among all the three? I would argue that she is more powerful than all others uh, because uh, he has not only concentrated, uh, consolidated his power quickly, and uh, he has also uh, eliminated all the factional right potential rivals uh, and uh, placed his lawyers uh, in uh, their places. Uh, in fact, uh, he has upset, upset a non-standing practice of internal power balance uh, at the top level of Chinese leaders. More was balanced by his uh, revolutionary comrades, Deng Xiao, uh, Liu, Xiao, Liu Xiaoqi and some others. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was balanced by Chen Yun, and uh, uh, Jiang Zemin was balanced by Deng Xiaoping, and Hu Jintao was balanced by uh, Jiang Zemin. But who is now? Balancing Xi Jinping, I don't see any. So Xi Jinping is running the country now without the clear rival. So he has uh, not become a Mao Zedong in terms of power concentration, has also uh, changed the uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping, Hu Jintao, uh, Jiang Zemin's uh, so-called collective leadership, consensus building policy making um, practice. Uh, and uh, he has uh, uh, really become the most powerful leader in China. So using his uh, power, he has uh, carried out a fundamental uh, policy reorientation, foreign policy reorientation uh, of China becomes uh, he abandoned clearly Deng Xiaoping's uh, no profile foreign policy, changed Deng Xiaoping, Hu, Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin's uh, uh, featured um, uh, uh, developmental multi for sure. Then he advocates the so-called big power 
foreign policy? What is big power foreign policy? Proactively shape international environment rather than um, react to it. So he has uh, made a lot of new initiatives, much, much more than anyone else uh, in the PRC history. And also uh, he has advocated this really confrontational foreign policy direction, fighting spread, Dou Zhenjing Zheng, and the set red lines have a Di Xian Sui best line uh, thinking, and uh, uh, tries to uh, defend so-called a uh, core national interest, which is core national interest, is that bottom line, bottom line of uh, national survival. You cannot negotiate, you cannot compromise. So he would, uh, for me, it's something he will not conduct diplomacy. He's fighting using the military. Uh, we don't need the foreign ministry, as uh, Susan Shrek said. Wang Yi, those people, we don't need them. We need only those military officers to fight for the islands, to build those islands uh, in South China Sea. And so he put a very big new face of China in international arena. Then the question here becomes, uh, he, when he puts such a confrontational posture international, he has been met with uh, unprecedented uh, resistance, pushback against China, especially not only because of his assertive foreign policy, but also authoritarian, uh, domestic, uh, repressive domestic policies. So in that case, Xi Jinping has become incre incredibly insecure. The insecurity now has uh, characterized his psyche, his uh, policy making process. So what he has done in the last several years or uh, has elevated security to the level of development parallel. If there's conflict between security and development, obviously he'll give up development, economic development for security. Here, when we say security, it's mostly from domestic lens, the regime security, in his own words, political security. So here relates to this insecurity, we have seen another very interesting development that is, uh, I mean, for the investors, that is uh, uh, his tolerance to risk, our risk tolerance has been increased in against those uh, economic uh, pushback or economic costs. The COVID zero policy is a very typical example. Three years, Chinese economy suffered so much he will not change until the protest November took place. So the November protest threatened security. So that's why he changed his policy. So here we have the investors have to be aware of his policy priority for China today, not development. Even for the last couple of weeks, we saw this so-called uh, new development of economic uh, uh, emphasis, I don't know is tactical, long-term, fundamental, or just for a temporary uh, development. So his mind regime security, uh, so-called national security is still the priority. So another risk, I think we have to be uh, aware of that, his power concentration, someone mentioned earlier, has a, also taken a huge risk, risk uh, for the policy making process. He is uh, living in a bubble. Uh, just like uh, Putin in a bubble to making decisions. Nobody around him will tell him honestly about the truth. And uh, he lives in his own kind of uh, environment. And uh, he, he, everybody took, uh, have been told him what he wants to listen. Everybody guess what is his mind will tell him that. So in that context, he would uh, make decisions uh, make uh, unpredictable decisions from outside or irrational decisions from outside. So he would lead China to some kind of uh, 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 decisions of uh, uh, adventure, of new return. It's, and uh, that also relates to, 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 to another, uh, what I call the virtual cycle. He made he, he met decisions which is wrong. And the consequence will be very uh, uh, serious. Then he wants to defend his mistake. He makes more mistakes. So China would come to a really vicious cycle in the next five years, or even not 10 years, or his lifetime if he's in power. So China so, has entered a very uncertain future. That's 
Right, right. So we've got the um, sort of powder keg combination of perhaps the most powerful leader in Chinese history yet, along with one of the most insecure leaders. And those two combinations don't bode well. Um, we've also got Chris arguing that socialization plays a big role in people, in, in decision makers, that even though maybe people don't take Mao's ideologies um, at its face value, they are socialized by some of those ideologies. And I would add to that, I agree with you um, that if there's any sort of institutional or structural continuity, it has to do with campaign politics. And we've seen that um, with she, um, uh, Xi's policies with the tech sector. Um, we'll probably continue to see that. And campaign politics, I always tell my students, it's it's when you talk about China, China, you're not talking about policymaking as much as you're talking about campaign politics. And campaign politics are very unpredictable and uh, not great for um, predicting um, predicting what's going to happen, not great for the stability that investors are looking for. Um, so now I want to turn to audience questions. Um, we've got a great many of them. I want to pick up on one that had been asked by a number of people ahead of, ahead of time, which is about demographic changes. And I want to turn this question over to Steve, because you mentioned that in your, in your opening remarks. Um, is China starting a demographic death spiral as an economic power? Because we know that, um, you know, working, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the population is aging. That's why you see the CCP having moved fairly quickly from a longstanding one child policy, then to the two child, and then very quickly after that to three child. And, and, and so the, it's obviously a problem, but is this going to be fixable um, in the short term? And how is that going to impact economics in, in the short term and long term? Well, as we've seen from um, the Japanese experience, which predates um, China's uh, aging profile by about 20 to 25 years, it's very, very difficult uh, to fix. But economics does prescribe uh, a, um, uh, a possibility that unfortunately uh, China is failing uh, to um, rise to, to meet, and that is when the working age population is contracting and is likely to do so in China for the next 20 to 25 years, despite these uh, 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 efforts to um, uh, incentivize uh, women to have more children, even if they were to work, which is dubious, that would not have an impact on the working age population for at least uh, 20 to 25 years. In the meantime, the only offset, the only option uh, that economies have is to boost pr the growth rate of productivity to offset to, in other words, to, to maintain uh, a higher growth rate by extracting more incremental output from a shrinking population. Productivity is going the other way in China right now. For the last 10 years, total factor productivity has been declining significantly as uh, Xi Jinping has shifted uh, power to ossified, low productivity state-owned enterprises. And to the point that uh, uh, Chris has, has made, and I totally agree with it, uh, by squeezing um, uh, the high productivity uh, private sector uh, internet platform companies, that removes an important prop uh, to uh, productivity uh, going forward. So, um, you know, it's, it's the wrong solution for an aging society. One of China's demographers, leading demographers has often said the difference uh, between China and Japan is that China is likely to get uh, older before it gets rich, unlike Japan. Uh, and that's the truth. And I would just throw it back to um, uh, Sui Sheng, who uh, talked about, uh, you know, the three categories of leaders uh, and uh, uh, you know, I think the risk is, is you put uh, Xi Jinping uh, prematurely in the transformational category. You may end up putting him in your third category of a failed leader if he cannot deliver uh, on the economic legitimacy that he has promised uh, the people through the Chinese dream and all these other lofty, aspirational, soaring rhetorical um, uh, imagery that that is framed his own political campaign uh, to the, the, the Chinese people. He's got a growth problem. It's a serious one. It's not going to go away. It's going to be enduring. 
I say this as someone who's been an unabashed China optimist for 25 years. Uh, I am no longer of that optimistic view. Uh, yeah, and just uh, it's, it's no surprise that, um, you know, when you have a policy shift in order to really boost um, childbirth, you got to give people incentives. And women are saying, especially women in the urban areas are saying, we don't want to have more kids. Like who wants to have more kids? It's very costly to raise kids in China. And there's not any sort of economic incentives to do so. Um, uh, so I want to then turn to Taiwan. And, and here I want to turn it over to Susan to answer this question, because you talk a lot about the importance of continued diplomacy, even when it's very, very difficult. So we have a question from the audience. Um, is there still room for diplomacy to manage the Taiwan issue or is conflict now in inevitable? I think I know your answer to that one, but uh, maybe you can expound upon that. If the answer is of some version of there must be some time, there must still be time. What is the first step towards this diplomatic solution and who should be taking it? Well, the most important element in a diplomatic solution is really Beijing's actions and treatment of Taiwan. Um, it will be extremely difficult for Xi Jinping to persuade the people of Taiwan that there is a path of peaceful reunification, especially after the takeover of Hong Kong. I mean, look what's happening this week with the trial of the democracy activists in Hong Kong who simply sought to have a primary election. You know, uh, so people, it will be extremely difficult, but uh, perhaps not impossible to at least stabilize a, uh, a relationship between this island and the mainland, which is so close to it. I mean, if Taiwan were universally recognized as an sovereign independent country already, it would still be important for it to find a modus vivendi with this powerful government on the mainland. So, um, but uh, instead of pursuing some kind of reassurance, at least talking to the DPP government in Taiwan, uh, Xi Jinping has taken this more intimidating approach, aggressive approach. And that then has, even though the folks on Taiwan are uh, not panicking at all about that, in the United States, American politicians are uh, competing with one another to show how much they love Taiwan and how much they're put, uh, going to put the United States to the defense of Taiwan. I am all in favor of strengthening deterrence. And I think it's an extremely positive development that Japan, as well as other countries, are uh, seeing the uh, preservation of Taiwan's autonomy as a and peace in the Taiwan Strait as important for their own security and therefore strengthening working with the United States to deter aggression from Beijing. But the actions by American politicians are really irresponsible. Uh, pursuing all sorts of symbolic gestures, including McCarthy visit, uh, Pelosi visit, uh, and what it's even possible that they may uh, introduce legislation to formally treat Taiwan as a sovereign state, which would be so pr provocative to Beijing that even the most restrained, responsible leader would find it very difficult not to react violently 
to such a move and threaten Taiwan. So um, it's a very, uh, I urge people to look at the little report we did as part of the task force uh, that I co-chair with Orville Shell. It's on the tw uh, 21st Century China Center website. It's on the Asia Society website, which talks about how to preserve peace in the Taiwan Strait uh, through uh, a prudent set of policies by all three sides. It's a very important message, uh, Susan. Um, I wanted to uh, turn it over, I think, to, uh, to Chris. Um, I wanted to ask about AI. Um, how might recent and upcoming advancements in AI you think impact the bilateral relationship in areas such as business, military, law, education? And I'm asking you this because you're at a business school. Uh, uh, Mike, Mike, Chris, yeah. Thank you, I need to have AI actually, you know, to take my mic, um, mic off. So uh, yeah, I, 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 first of all, I'm not in any way an expert on AI, but I mean, I think this is an area where China has really staked out uh, an ambitious position like many other areas. You know, I think they were the first country with a national AI strategy in 2017. Uh, some of the AI areas like facial recognition, I think, are pretty, you know, advanced. Um, you know, I've seen this in person, actually. I took students to China uh, in 2019 and actually visited an AI company. We got to see their control room where they were monitoring, you know, all kinds of people in different cities. And the students <laughs> were astounded they would show this to us. And they were very, very proud of it. Um, uh, you know, the book, uh, surveil I think it's Surveillance State actually, though, discusses how maybe the sort of behind the scenes, the AI is not as advanced, advanced as they, that the government is actually portraying. So, I mean, that's an interesting, you know, thing to think about. And I do think that, you know, to my earlier point about innovation trajectories, that, you know, a top-down, heavily subsidized um, model that is pushing for things like, you know, patents, you know, there ends up being a lot of corruption, you know, the big fund in chips um, is an example of that. I mean, I think, you know, innovations like chat GPT are coming out of the US where I think there are, is much more of a, you know, sort of bottoms up entrepreneurial driven, um, you know, innovation trajectory. And so I think, you know, aside from facial recognition, which is, you know, like Shui Sheng said, you know, security being really the paramount, uh, that I, that, you know, the U.S. I think is 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 um, going to going to be in the leading position on AI uh, for you know the foreseeable future. And as you know, she continues to be really consolidated his power. I mean, this power of the economy. You know, it's even less and less likely that China will become an AI superpower, as Kai Fu Lee uh, said. Okay, so the U.S has nothing to worry about, or maybe not as much to worry about as one would anticipate in terms of AI competition, according to Chris. We'll see um, if that plays out. Um, so uh, I wanted to turn it over, perhaps being our last question uh, to Sui Sheng, um, because this is really a question about, um, it's a big question about the state of the world situation, and it's linked to President Xi himself. So given uh, Xi's about face change on COVID, and I might add on, on a number of policies, is it possible that he will also reverse his position um, on foreign policy? Is it possible that we see uh, an about face or a turn from wolf warrior diplomacy to something else, you know, panda diplomacy, I don't know what, you know, to something else uh, in, the, in the near future? And first of all, let me uh, uh, answer Steve's uh, question here first. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping might be a failed leader, which I hope he will. And uh, he uh, very possibly like to be a failed leader because of uh, his uh, mistakes, uh, COVID, zero, zero COVID, and also sudden U-turn. And uh, he might make more mistakes. Uh, he has not trust among those educated people in China. In the next five years uh, will be very difficult for him. 
uh, to uh, accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So that's the uh, question. Uh, regarding uh, if uh, Xi Jinping would uh, fundamentally change uh, his uh, posture, so-called uh, uh, wolf warrior type of foreign policy, uh, people are talking about the uh, uh, last several weeks or months or so, he has softened his tone. Is that a softening of uh, tone, tactical uh, or fundamental? My uh, answer to that is uh, tactical. He's not fundamental. His mind has not changed. The situation has changed, forced him to softer his tone. But now, if uh, blinking the visit, I mean, canceling his uh, visit, the Chinese response is, is bizarre, I think. They even said, we never invite him. We never talk about, uh, about that. The balloon thing also is, uh, they lie so clearly, but they try to, uh, 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 to st still stand this kind of high uh, ground type. So that shows how in turn inside their uh, in, internal circle of, of Xi Jinping, they still uh, uh, believe uh, in what the China should uh, co uh, confront, all those what they think the evil uh, Western powers. Uh, that's the, uh, I studied nationalism. I found that the fundamental difference uh, of uh, Xi Jinping's nationalism and uh, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Deng Xiaoping nationalism well, is that uh, previously those nationalist uh, uh, sentiments was affirmative, try to affirm a positive for us. Now Xi Jinping's nationalism has target at evil others. All the outside world is so evil and they try to undermine China rights, they try to get China. So that kind of fundamental mind, I don't think has changed. So in that context, I would not see a fundamental change of Chinese okay. policy. Okay, and I'm glad you mentioned the balloon because I promised we would get to that and we didn't really do that. Um, so I want to thank, first of all, the audience for, for tuning in to this very stimulating discussion. And please stay tuned and register for other great events at Brookings. And I also, of course, want to thank our prominent um, panelists for, uh, for writing the books that you did and for joining us for the discussion. And thank you to the Brookings Institution and to the China Center. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your week.